Well, turns out it's not just Pete Nance that needs these lemon Oreos. These beautiful little yellow circular cookies are all of a sudden something of a rallying cry for the entire Carolina family. And one that might just help save the season. You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. Yes, March, the greatest month of the year. It's like Christmas Day. Well, no, that's that's Thursday, the first day of the tournament. But this is like a precursor to it. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. I'm Isaac Shade, your host of the only daily North Carolina show out there. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. By the way, our episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook partner of Locked On Network. Make every moment more and visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Coming up on the show, we got some leftovers. You got to clear those out of the fridge before they go bad from the Florida State game. And got some bubble updates for you, some news on the women's ACC tournament, some news on the women's all-conference team, some uh, news on seeding in the men's ACC tournament, all sorts of great stuff coming up. But before we get there, I have a super fun story that I have to share with you. Well, I never in my life knew that I needed lemon Oreos and crab cakes to go together, but apparently they do. I am joined today on Locked on Tar Heels by the president of Jimmy's Famous Seafood, our guy, John Minadakis, massive North Carolina fan. And obviously, you've all heard, and we've been talking about it on the show, about Pete Nance's affinity for lemon Oreos and how Coach Davis gave him a package uh, on, on his couch in his office before Saturday's game against Virginia. Well. North Carolina got to their hotel in Tallahassee and what was waiting on them? A lemon Oreo or two. The man behind it is none other than John himself. And so I said, John, you got to come on the show today and share the story with everybody. So John, A, this awesome. B, would you just, would you just tell us the story of what transpired to make this happen? Yeah, for sure, man. I mean, it happened. It put the, we put it together pretty quickly. It's a pretty funny story, I guess, now that I'm looking back on it. <laughs> uh, you know, so we were actually uh, down in Miami for the Food and Wine Festival this past weekend. And, um, you know, we, we watched the game down there. And as everybody knows is watching this, you know, it was one of our best performances of the year, especially that first half. So, you know, I'm, I'm on cloud nine, obviously, and scrolling through Twitter on my way to, to dinner. And I, I see the Lemon Oreo story. And, uh, you know, I just keep seeing it pop up over the course of the night. So, uh, you know, had a drink or two or three and, um, <laughs> you know, it was getting to be a late night. And I, I told my wife, I said, uh, Hey, remind me tomorrow, no matter what, I got this crazy idea. I want to send a case of lemon Oreos to the team's hotel in, in Tallahassee. And she's like, kind of like rolls her eyes. And, and that was the end of it that night. I wake up the next morning and she's like, I, you told me to remind you about lemon Oreos. I was like, Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, hit up Armando. I said, uh, going to need the the address for the hotel tonight. And he was like, for what? And I said, I, you know, I got something planned. And he's like, all right, here it is. <laughs> so at this point, it's it's a matter of execution. You got a couple hours to put it together. And uh, come to find out, man, uh, lemon Orioles are very hard to find. <laughs> so uh, especially, I guess, in a college town like Tallahassee, it's a, a very peculiar request. So I'm striking out, man, like left and right. And, uh, you know, we're at the pool and everybody's yelling at me to get off my phone. And uh, I'm like, I'm, again, I'm trying to put this together. I, you know, this is going to be really funny. And um, started making direct phone calls to Publix because, yeah, you know, they're, they're kings down there, obviously. And uh, one way or another, I, I get a hold of uh, their purchaser. And <laughs> you know, he, he knows exactly where every single box of um, lemon Oreos in the region was within an hour and a half radius. And then I have to download the Instacart app because, you know, we got to get somebody to drive them there because I don't know anybody that lives around there. And I was able to get a hold of four different people who did a pretty lengthy drive and uh, had pretty much all of them there. Uh, I was able to get a total of 36. You know, my goal was to get at least 100, but couldn't make it happen, unfortunately. And so they're all, you know, getting delivered to the hotel. I think they all got there by 3.30 or so. 
And uh, at this point, and here's the real challenge, right? You got a hotel down there who's hosting the opposing visiting rival team. So, you know, you're just crossing your fingers and hoping that, uh, you know, somebody nice picks up the phone for, <laughs> for better or for worse. And, uh, you know, the people were super friendly there. And, you know, just initiating that conversation was funny. Um, <laughs> you know, this is it's gonna it's gonna sound weird, guys, but I have a lot of cookies being delivered to your hotel today, and the reason why is this. So they were really understanding, and they created like a little display, I guess, right at the entrance for. for I told them I want the first thing uh, when the team shows up is to see is is the lemon Oreos, and they put they put together a pretty cool display, and they laid them um, around the entire check in area, uh, from what I understand, and uh, I was at dinner with a couple buddies and. You know, my phone starts blowing up and it was, you know, Armando and one of the coaches, they were like, you did this, didn't you? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, they said, you know, uh, to a man, just everybody loved it, which was, you know, the exact reaction that I was going for, man. Cool. Like, yeah, I just really wanted, look, you know, those guys have been under the spotlight all year and they've been under a ton of pressure. And to see them playing loose, you know, Saturday against Virginia and to see those shots start falling, especially for Pete, you know, who, you know, has had his struggles this season. You know, I just wanted to do like my part as a fan uh, to to keep that going. And I knew that you know that that would do the trick because you know if you play a great game against a great team and then you got to hit the road the next day, you know, your mind might start going back to you know, the Notre Dame game and stuff like that. And you know, remembering that you know, you you have to win this game. And you know, we, we have lost as we all know in Florida State in the past. Um, so you know, to, to really this alleviate the stress and keep everything lighthearted. I guess it accomplished, you know, what I was, you know, going for as a fan. So, you know, all, all this was, and it's just something that a creative fan, you know, is more than anything. And just, you know, as you guys know, you know, I love UNC and to be able to just put a smile on a couple of guys' faces, I thought was awesome, you know. Um, and then reading that, you know, coach was looking for Oreos yesterday and couldn't find them before the trip. And then to just walk into that, it just made it all the better. And, you know, for the guys to have something to rally about uh, around, uh, superstitious, so to speak, as we've seen in so many movies and, and so many, you know, winning teams in the past, I think it's great. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to watch where this goes. You know, college game day is going to be there on Saturday, so people can get super creative with that. You know, Pete obviously deserves an NIL deal with Oreo, which uh, would be, you know, one of the first of its kind, you know, because NIL has only been a thing for not even two years now. So to see, like, the team rally around something in a superstitious fashion uh, would be pretty cool to watch. So, and that's, that's kind of where we are. You know, I, I, um, you know, I guess I do have five days to, to see if I can come up with something else, but you know, after, you know, I did my part on behalf of the fans. So I guess from now it's, it's up to the players and, and whoever else wants to get, you know, have some fun with it. Yeah. John, this is so great. Like, like you're saying, like on the surface, it just seems fun and silly, but legitimately, I, I think what you're saying is so spot on. It provides a moment of levity. It reminds the guys to just have fun and enjoy while packing on a few calories. No problem with that. They run a lot. Um, and, and to hear you say like this accomplished what I wanted it to. And I mean, I even saw earlier today, Pete Nance had tweeted at Oreos and they said something back to it. Like it's like the connections are being made. Now here's the question I have for you. Did you indulge in any of some Oreos yourself, my friend? I did not, uh, you know, but come to find out they're my wife's favorite flavor. So now I know that moving forward. And uh, we were actually at dinner with, with Taylor Vipolis from, you know, uh, inside Carolina yep. that night. And uh, he thought she was joking. He's like, oh, you really like them? And she's like, oh, yeah, they're the best. Because I did read an article that they ranked like 28th out of all the flavors or something terribly. So, you know, apparently they are great. Uh, and uh, Apparently they keep my wife happy and UNC keeps me happy. So, you know, in our household, it is a match made in heaven for sure. That's great. Did did you get any uh, – did anybody send you pictures of what the lobby looked like or anything? Yeah, I got, I got one picture from uh, from Coach May. He said, did you okay. do this? <laughs> <laughs> I guess, so I guess like Armando was told him or something. Uh, yeah. He said, you know, everybody loved it. Coach oh. loved it. So, you know, mission accomplished. Great. I mean, that's, that's, you put a huge smile on my face and, uh, you know, this game the next day, put an even bigger smile on my face and, and every other Tar Heel fan out there. And, you know, Saturday's the, the big test. So, you know, we got to find some big Oreos uh, before Saturday night. Massive Oreos. Well, John, I'm going to have to have you text me that picture so I can share it here as, as we're talking and people can see it. But uh, speaking of, Saturday night, Carolina hosting Duke right there on the bubble. What, what do you think is going to happen in that game? How's it going to play out? 
Yeah, I'm the eternal optimist uh, when it comes to, to Carolina. So I think we, you know, just like we do with Virginia, uh, we do match up well with Duke. Uh, you know, Duke's got a great team this year. Uh, you know, but when you see the, the job that Leakey was able to do on Filipowski and, uh, you know, those shots that Carolina missed in that first game, they're just statistically not going to miss them again. You know, I, I am, you know, concerned a bit about Whitehead playing this game, playing great. Uh, he didn't play in the first game. Right. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's our job as, as fans to make sure that place is rocking, to make sure that the guys know that we're behind them and uh, to send Leakey and Armando off in style on their senior night. Whew, that I'm that makes me emotional just thinking about Leakey senior night 2.0 and, and Mondo and, and what these guys have meant to this program. I mean, let, let's just say one word about Leakey before we get out, John. He will set the Carolina record for most games played when he steps onto the court Saturday night. Um what has this young man meant to you in his career? You know, I just as a fan, um, he's just very underappreciated. If I had to use one word, uh, it's it's hard work, man, to play defense at that level that he plays every single night. And the great thing about being an elite defender, as Leaky is, is for the most part, you're not going to have an off night because you know if you're a great offensive player, and he's turning into that, uh, you know, your shot might not fall sometime. Uh, but when you're an elite defender, it's all about effort. And as long as you're bringing that effort, as long as you have the tools, and as long as you're dedicated to your craft, you will have a great night every single night. And Leakey has the effort. He has the tenacity. And you know, his rebounding, I've seen many statistics throughout the year that it's it's really taken off even more this season. You know, I can think of a few times where there's been a congestion in the paint and Leakey goes up and you see his arm just kind of go above everybody else's. His blocks have been at very opportune times. Um, you know, he made some big, big threes that kept us in the game against Duke in the second half. So just, you know, I feel like very similar to, you know, Theo Pinson, that he's just one of those guys that we're not going to appreciate as much as we should have uh, until he's gone. But, you know, just the, the greatest image that I'll probably have of Leakey is, you know, him crying last year after we started going on our run because, you know, he's been through the lows with this program and, uh, to see him finally achieve the success that he dreamed of and worked towards you know, as a fan was just uh, – it's just why we watch, right? Great stuff. John Minadakis, thank you so much for just your creativity and your thoughtfulness. Um, what, a, what a great story this is, and hopefully something that continues to spur on another great March run, just like we all experienced last year. Brother, keep churning out those crab cakes, killing the game up there in Maryland. So grateful for you and proud of the work you do. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Go Heels. Hey, what happens when you got leftovers in the fridge? You got to eat them before they go bad, right? Exactly. We've got five leftovers for you from the Florida State game on Monday night, and we'll do that in just a second. But first, I need to tell you that this episode, it's brought to you by FanDuel, which is our official sports betting partner on the Locked On Network. We're at the midway point of the NBA season, and now's the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Why? Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. That's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. All you got to do is download the app. It's safe. It's secure. It's super easy to use. And then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores, three pointers drained, whether or not Russ Westbrook's going to have 80,000 turnovers in a game, whatever it may be. Uh, plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with same game parlay. So don't miss your chance to get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. Once again, that's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports and official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, let's get right into these leftovers. Let's get them in the microwave. Make sure you cover it up so that food doesn't splatter everywhere. And then let's dive into it. By the way, some food you can warm up in the microwave, some leftovers you got to get in the oven, right? Pizza, french fries. How do you warm up your leftovers? I need to know information like this. Let me know in the comments. Number one in our leftovers, is there a concern for Armando Baycott? He's had now back-to-back -back games with some foul trouble, back-to-back -back games where he wasn't really, didn't really do a ton. I mean, he had double digits against Virginia, 11 points, but only had six field goal attempts played uh, his minutes played were in the 20s in both of these games only had one point against Florida State 
So is there a concern for Armando Baycott? Nope. Absolutely not. He's had two games, exactly two games this season, in which he did not score in double digits. Monday at Florida State, where he got one. And the other was the game at Virginia when he left the game just over a minute in with an ankle injury and never came back and scored zero points. Every other game this season, he has scored in double digits. So don't let just a little recency bias concern you with Armando Baycott. My man is going to be just fine. Thank you very much. And in fact, I think uh, I think we might be in store for something special on senior night against Duke. I know they're long and athletic, just like Florida State. Uh, but I just have a feeling. Next, in our leftovers, uh, we just asked concern for Armando Baycott, concern for R.J. Davis. Now, Isaac, why on earth would you say that? It looks like R.J. has all of, a stu- all of a sudden started shooting better again, took off that tape on his shooting index finger against Virginia and looked much better. Same thing against Florida State on Monday night. But you might or might not have seen this, but he, it appeared that he re-jammed it somehow, some way in rebounding action in the second half of the Florida State game. Didn't really see much um, from him in terms of like shot attempts after that, so it was hard to get a gauge on if it would be affecting him or not. So keep an eye on that in the lead up to Saturday. If, if you get picture or video from practice or anything of that nature, um, look for him during warm-ups on Saturday. Just see the state of that finger. Number three, uh, this one I am a little concerned about. I'm not worried about Armando. I'm I'm not worried about RJ. Yeah, sure, his shooting, but I'm not worried about his effectiveness and his ability to factor or, or be a major factor in the game. This one I am concerned about. There's a disturbing trend the past couple games. Carolina has been phenomenal in the first, or not, at, at least built out to a double digit lead. I don't know that I would say what they did phenomenal. They had those nine turnovers against Florida state, but they played really well in the first half in both of those games, just raining threes from everywhere. 20 combined threes in those two first halves, by the way, um, a 16 point halftime lead over Virginia an 18 point halftime lead over Florida state. But here was my concern. You've heard me talk about this ad nauseum this season that this Carolina team just has these stretches where it's like they forget that they're supposed to be a dominant basketball team and they don't do things. Sometimes it's down the stretch in the first half. Sometimes it's nine turnovers in the first half, whatever it may be. One of the ways that um, inattention to detail has reared its ugly head these past two games is coming out of the halftime locker room and starting the second half strong. Again, 16-point halftime lead against Virginia. They go on a 7-0 run to start the half. 18-point lead against Florida State. They go on a 6-0 run to cut uh, into the lead right out of halftime. Against Florida State, that's not going to matter. Against Virginia at home when Virginia's playing, been playing as bad as they have, it's not going to matter all that much. You're able to do it. But you saw those games got tighter than they should have been. Florida State got it within four, had a free throw to make it three. Uh, I think if I remember correctly, the closest Virginia got was six, but still not none of that should happen. And I think a lot of it is attributed to Carolina starting poorly in the second half. So here's what you need to look for against Duke on Saturday. Not only can Carolina have a great first 20 minutes, but are they are they ready to go coming out of the locker room? Are they are they fired up? What, what's happening? Why is this a thing? It is a thing. And we need to wrestle with it and figure out why. Number four in our leftovers. This one's going to be happier. Carolina on Monday night against Florida State had four different players score 15 or more points. That's the starters minus Armando, basically. Leakey, Pete Nance, RJ Davis, Caleb Love. All of them had 15 or more points. That's a great offensive balance. And that's the thing you want to see because then teams can't key on Armando. Then teams can't key on Caleb or RJ. You have to account for everybody. And in this case, that includes Leaky Black. In this case, that includes Pete Nance. Teams have to be ready for them. And when you have to guard all five guys, it makes your team even better. Well, thinking about in terms of how often this happens, 
when would you guess is the last time that Carolina had four or more player, four players score 15 or more points? I'll just go ahead and tell you, this is the only time it's happened this season. And here's why I bring it up. You remember now, perhaps the last time it happened? It was the last regular season game of Coach Krzyzewski's entire career. Inside Cameron Indoor Stadium last year, ending the regular season, Carolina had four players get 20 or more points. Remember, that was where essentially the Iron Five was born because the, the five starters played all, like all five of them played all 20 minutes of the second half or combined all 100 minutes of the second half. And so you had all five starters other than Leakey scored 20 or more points. That was the last time it happened. And for me, this just shows that Carolina is continuing to get more cohesion cohesion with one another, um, particularly the starters um, and with Puff Johnson and other things like that. Can they maintain that against Duke at home on Saturday. You sure hope so. You'd love to see that. Obviously, we're going to see um, a little bit of a different group of starters just because of senior day. Um, but those guys will be quickly cycled out and get back to the five typical starters. Um, you'd love to see those uh, those guys get a, a bucket or two and help uh, grab an early lead. But um, all that to say, Carolina seems to be finding more rhythm. The ball is moving better, things like that. But 0.5 of our of our leftovers, the last thing to eat, so our leftover dessert, oh man, give me some apple pie or something like that. Part of the reason this is looking better, part of the reason Carolina did so well, having four players score 15 or more points, is assist percentage. Is literally now two games in a row, and that, that doesn't seem like much of a run, but for this Tar Heels team, it is. For the past two games... Carolina has had an assist percentage above 50%, meaning they assisted on over 50% of their made field goals. Why am I so excited about that? It's happened this season twice, but both of those were in the non-conference portion of the schedule. This is the first time in ACC play that Carolina has had back-to-back games in which they assisted on 50% of their field goals. Now, obviously we wish that the earlier part of the season would be better, whatever, Let's be happy about what's happening now. Let's be happy about how that helps bring a a more balanced scoring approach. Because again, it makes your scouting report so much more difficult if you're the opposition and you see that any of these dudes can come out and drop 15 or 20. That's what has to happen. Because remember, the fifth guy that didn't drop 15 plus in this game against Florida State was Armando Baycott. So I think we're okay there. Carolina's sharing the ball better. They're scoring more balanced, balancedly. We're making that a word tonight, <laughs> and I love it. <clears throat> so there you go. There's some pieces of leftovers from the Florida State game. Just really interesting stuff to unpack there. Speaking of unpack, Pat Kilby, remember, will be on tomorrow's show instead of today's show, and we will have unpacking it with Coach Pack. Well, getting into our last segment of the day, things are getting bubbly just about every night. I've got more to share with you about bubble movement and how it affected the Tar Heels on Tuesday night. We're learning more about the ACC seating picture and brace yourself because the bubble news is not all good from Tuesday night. We'll talk about it in just a second. All right, bubble stuff, ACC tournament seeding, women's basketball ACC awards, and women's ACC tournament matchup. We're going to just kind of breeze through these here. So let's start with men's ACC tournament seeding. On Tuesday night, Duke won over NC State in Cameron, 71 to 67. Boston College beat Wake Forest at Wake Forest, 71 to 69. I give you those two results to say updated standings as far as the Tar Heels are concerned. NC State is sixth in the conference at 12 and eight. North Carolina is seventh in the conference at 11 and eight. And Wake Forest is eighth at 10 and nine. And I'm only going to give you those three teams because Carolina can't get any higher than NC State's sixth place spot. And they can't drop any lower than Wake Forest's eighth place spot. Um, So basically that means right now Carolina could be six, seven, or eight. We, so that means for sure, though, that the Tar Heels will play next Wednesday is when they'll open ACC tournament play. So a week from the day, keep your eyes peeled for that. And you want to be <clears throat> the sixth seed or the seventh seed because those teams 
both play a team that had played on Tuesday on opening day. So one of the teams 10 through 15, while the eighth seeded team has to play the ninth seeded team, neither of whom have played yet in uh, in the ACC tournament. And so that that helps. So you want to uh, a win at Duke or a win versus Duke guarantees the sixth or seventh spot. The problem is um, we can't really figure out yet because these three teams, North Carolina, NC State, and Wake, Carolina split with both of them. They were one and one with against NC State and one and one against Wake Forest. One at home, lost on the road to both of them. And obviously, when you have a tiebreaker, which could be the case with either team, uh, when all is said and done after Saturday's results, it comes down to head-to-head matchups. Well, Carolina split with both of them. And so then the next tiebreaker is you go to the team in the first place position at the end of the regular season. Unfortunately, it's still possible uh, like Miami, Virginia, and Pitt are all still right there with Pitt holding the slight advantage right now. So we just got to keep our eyes on it and it will continue to unfold. But right now it's enough to know Carolina will play on Wednesday and they'll be six, seven, or eight as more unfolds, which uh, we, we will find out. Uh, I'll let you know. NC State's done. They're 12 and eight. So they have finished conference play. And so um, Carolina is basically playing to either tie them or uh, we'll see what both Carolina and Wake do on Saturday. Wake is at Syracuse to end the regular season there. Now, in terms of bubble conversation, several I, I had mentioned yesterday's show five different games that had implications for the Tar Heels teams that were surrounding them. So let's start with Virginia and Clemson. The Cavs held serve at home, which is great news on two fronts. Number one, they beat Clemson, who was on the bubble, behind North Carolina, but now they're even more behind. They're behind her, the Tar Heels now on the bubble. So that's great news, but also it's good for Virginia to have one because they're just right on that cut line, really close to it, where Carolina's win over them on Saturday might fall out of quad one status. I know that's wild, but um, it shouldn't. We will know when the net rankings refresh on Wednesday morning. So by the time you're listening to or watching this, you can check out the net rankings to see where Virginia has landed and, and hopefully they will still be in that top 30. That's the number where it's got to stay. So that helps Carolina. Uh, another one that helps Carolina is Kansas beat Texas Tech at home. Um, which Kansas clinches at least a share of the Big 12 title yet again. I mean, just insane the run that they've been on for the since Bill Self's been there, basically. Um, but Texas Tech was a little fur- even further back than Clemson on the bubble. But still, you want all these other teams to lose, and Texas Tech did. The problem, and this is why I said there is some bad news, is teams ahead of North Carolina that I was watching uh, won. So San Diego State had an eight point lead over Boise state with like four and a half minutes to go. And then Boise state went on a 14 0 run to close the game and ended up winning. So Boise state, uh, I would say at this point, they are probably safely in. Unfortunately, they were just, you know, depending on what bracketologist you look at two, three, four slots ahead of the Tar Heels. Same thing. uh, Mississippi state was playing South Carolina and listen, South Carolina is again, not good. Uh, they've got Gigi Jackson and, and that's about it, quite frankly, but, uh, they, they gave it a good run. They lost by six to Mississippi state, but Mississippi state, uh, should similar to Boise state now be pretty safely into the field. Um, and so th- that makes things tougher on Carolina. Cause that's two spots that could have fallen either behind them or, or close to behind them. So we'll keep our eyes on that. We'd also talked about New Mexico and Fresno State. New Mexico, similar to Texas Tech, is a little bit further off the bubble. And at the time when I'm recording this, they are beating Fresno State, but that's nothing to be too concerned about. All right, two more quick things turning our attention to the women's basketball team. The all-conference teams were announced on Tuesday, and Carolina has three entries. Uh, two ladies on the first team and one on the second. Keep in mind, this first team is comprised of 10 student athletes and the second team is also comprised of 10 student athletes with no 13. So Deja Kelly is on the first team as is Alyssa Utsby. Deja comes in at seventh in terms of the voting and Alyssa 10th. And then on the second team, Kennedy Todd Williams, it comes in at ninth on the second team or 19th overall in the conference. So some nice representation there from the ladies, unfortunately, like Paulina Paris didn't make it on to the all freshman team or anything like that. And um, Kayla McPherson really hadn't played enough, I, I think, to qualify. 
but she certainly probably would have otherwise. Sticking with the women, one other note on them. The women's ACC tourney kicks off today, Wednesday at 1. So you got games at 1, 3.30, and 6.30. Same thing as the guys, teams 10 through 15 are in competition. Keep your eye on the 3.30 game on ACC Network. That is 10th seeded Clemson against 15th seeded Pitt, and Carolina will play the winner of that game. Um, and that will take place Thursday, tomorrow night at 6, also on ACC Network. So if you want to kind of scout the competition, both of whom Carolina uh, is undefeated against this season, great news there. Um, but you want to make sure you're ready for that game. So uh, just lots going on with these teams. Love to keep track of it. Love to keep tabs on it. Again, uh, it might drive you batty. I've had people texting me and tweeting me all day like, Who's got to beat whom? What are we watching for? How do I cheer for this? I hate that this bracketologist has us here. Just, just win. That's what North Carolina... I'm going to keep telling you because because it's interesting. But bottom line, I'm going to keep reminding you. Carolina has to win. Beat Duke on Saturday and then take it out of the committee's hand. Just go win the whole blessed ACC tournament so that you don't even have to worry about being on the bubble. You're just in. Anyway, that uh, plenty more of that as the days continue to unfold. I'll share more with you for sure. But that does it for today's episode of Locked on Heels. Big thanks again to John Minadakis for coming on and joining me. Coming up tomorrow, Coach Pat Kilby. Always great stuff with him. People love when he is on the show, so make sure you tune in for that. You can follow us on Twitter at Locked on Heels or me at Isaac Shade. You can email the show LockedOnTarHeels at gmail.com. Make sure you get the Heel of the Week nominations in. I've had multiple already rolling in this week. So if you want to get somebody in good or bad, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, email the show locked on at gmail.com. One more time for you there. Please don't forget to subscribe, smash the like button and comment. Once again, we are within a hundred subscribers of 5,000 YouTube subscribers. We're trying to hit that. Um, I mean, at this point, the way it's going, we might be able to hit it by selection Sunday, but the goal has been, by the end of the national championship game to hit 5,000 subscribers. And so thank you for joining us in that. For your next listen, check out Locked On College Basketball. Myself and Andy Patton bring you everything you need to know about the world of college basketball all on one place. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and anywhere else you get podcasts. Hey, thanks so much for spending part of your Wednesday hanging out with me, sharing this great story about the lemon Oreos, and then unpacking some leftovers and everything else today. And I want to remind you, it's always a great day to be a Tar Heel, right? You know it. Until tomorrow, peace! Peace!